All right, we're going to go ahead and get into the question and answer time before our final teaching time. <clears throat> I tried to put these in categories so that we aren't jumping around, so I'm kind of methodical like that. So, could you please name other women false teachers that have proven themselves to be contrary to the word of truth other than Sarah, or Su it's Sarah Young and Beth Moore? Um, the ones I know for sure are Joyce Meyer and Jen Hatmaker. Now, I will say this, I really, um, I'm not really, really don't spend my time doing that, like hunting false teachers or anything like that. But I will say this, there are uh, two people that I would encourage you to look, uh, look up and they can help you better than I can. Justin Peters is one who, uh, that's his ministry. He's getting ready to come to our church in three weeks uh, and do another conference for us. But he really keeps up to date on all the false teachers of our day. Also a lady uh, named Michelle Leslie, I know I don't personally, but on her blog she lists uh, women teachers that um, you should steer away from. She also lists good women teachers. But again, ladies, please check them out. <laughs> Because I, I don't even like giving you that because I don't know. I've, but she does document things. And so Michelle Leslie's website, uh, Justin Peters. But the ones that I know for sure would be Joyce Meyer and Jen Hatmaker. I know there's some others that uh, seem to be on the slippery slope I'm very concerned about. Um, and I tell you how I find out is not just uh, by women sending me links to their messages, but I get on, uh, you know, even though I don't have a Twitter account, you can get on people's Twitter account. And I have gotten, I have seen some things on some female Bible teachers' uh, Twitter accounts that is appalling and blasphemous. And so um, I would encourage you to do that. Just look at it yourself. It's, uh, it's pretty mind-boggling and disturbing. Um, are there any other biblical women teachers you would recommend? Um, you know, this is a hard question because um, I, I remember when I first started speaking and I hadn't written a book yet, I went to a church in Missouri and the lady said, if you'd have only written a book, we could have got more ladies here. And I thought, well, that's a strange thing to say. So I would say this, there are a lot of faithful women out there faithfully teaching the Bible and you don't even know them. <laughs> Don't even know their names. And we'll get to know them in heaven. Um, and, you know, I, I really don't, Martha Peace, but she's been here with me before. I hate to even give you any names because of names of people that perhaps I've read their materials. Um, I don't know anything about their their private life. I do know Martha Peace. I know her private life. And so, as we talked about in the first John, they can preach a right message, but does their life back it up? And so... Um, you know, that's a, I, I would just, I just wouldn't want to stand here before you and give out names of, but I do know, like in my church, I have very faithful women uh, that teach besides me, and, uh, but I know their lives too, but the, you know, Jesus says, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is the greatest, right? So there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that we never heard of, but they were faithfully teaching the Bible, men and women, so um, I, I really don't know. Maybe Karen would usher out a name or something, but uh, do you have any, my friend? Huh? They come see, okay. Yeah, she's like, man, I don't know. Um, again, Michelle Leslie's website, she has, uh, I think it's 10 safe women, she calls them, uh, to, that you can listen to. And again, but I would check out those women and make sure that they are indeed. Okay, when it comes to naming names of false teachers, do you think it's a need for every teacher and pastor to do that? And what about prominent good teachers who don't? Um, I don't think, it. I think it depends. Um, you know, Paul called out the false teachers of his day. Jesus called out the false teachers of his day. But I don't think, at least my ministry is not calling out false teachers. But if it's in the text... <laughs> I will do it. If, uh, if I'm asking a q and A, I I will do it. I don't think we should be cowards. I think we should, uh, if we are going to call someone a false teacher, that's a very serious indictment. You should have proof of it. 
um, that you should be able to document it. And uh, so I think it depends. If the pastor's in a text regarding false teachers, I think he should be brave enough to call them out. Uh, he shouldn't be a coward. He shouldn't be a politician. But I don't think that we need to be using every time we are in a public setting to be calling out false teachers. We have a lot in the counsel of God. Uh, prominent good teachers who don't, um, I don't know. I don't know what their motive is. I mean, uh, some people have different uh, avenues in their ministry they go towards, and maybe it's just not their thing. I don't know. But I, I would say if they're coward about it, then uh, that's not good. Shame on them. But uh, um, if it's in the text and it call and the timing is right, I think it, that we should be willing to name names. Uh, Paul did, Jesus did. Um, what are your discerning thoughts about Nancy Lay DeMoss, biblical teacher or false prophet? Um, again, I have read some of her books. The, her books are good, the ones I've read. I went to a true woman <coughs> conference once <clears throat> with Debbie and my daughter and daughter-in-law. I think we traveled to Chicago. And her teaching that time was on Romans 11. Oh, the goodness and mercy of God. How And it was good. It was expositional. Um, but I didn't like some of the cheesy things that went on. And then since then, I know uh, this has been years ago that, and this was on her website, so I'm not saying anything that's not, wasn't on her website. I don't know if she's taken it off. Uh, at one of her sessions, she wanted something different or new, and she was asking God what to do. And so she said God showed her to you know, pass out chalk and the women were to draw circles and get in the circle and pray about whatever it is they wanted till God answered their prayer. And I took, I had an issue with that. Uh, Gets its roots in mysticism, uh, the circle maker, but I don't, I mean, that's the only thing I know of. Again, I haven't listened to her recently. Uh, I don't follow her teachings. I've only read some of her old books. I don't know anything about her recent books or anything like that. So it would be wrong of me to stand up here and say she's a false teacher. However, I did not think the prayer circle uh, was honoring to the Lord, nor is it, it biblical. So I imagine if I got up here right now and said, the Lord has shown me that I'm going to pass out chalk and we're going to draw circles. Yeah, Karen, Karen's saying, out the door you go. So... Uh, that's what I would want you to do. So that troubled me deeply. I don't think God told her to pass out chalk and draw chalks and get in and pray. So, um, But that's the only thing I know of. Okay, regarding discernment, uh, do, you think it is, do you think yoga is sinful? Um, I don't think a Christian woman should be participating in yoga. It has its roots in Hinduism and Buddhism, which are false religion. And so I, I would definitely do some research on that. I don't think we're to have, we're not to have anything to do with other gods. So um, I think if you're wanting to do some type of uh, exercise or something else, I'd, I'd get a good treadmill or something. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think that yoga would be wise for a Christian woman just because of where, read about it. I mean, just read about where its roots come from. Okay, thank you for taking a stand with the other woman who signed the open letter to Beth Moore. Has she responded? What is the next step? Have you been contacted by women whose eyes have been opened to her doctrinal errors? Um, I did not write the letter, even though my name is first after the letter, because the person who wrote the letter put us five ladies in alphabetical order. And guess what? Heck comes before Peace and Leslie and all those other ladies. So I was like, oh, good, I'm in trouble. So uh, I was like, I might as well get in trouble. But when I was first, uh, when the person who wrote the letter first contacted me and asked me if I would sign the letter because of their concern of her recent cuddling up to the LGBT community, I really, my first response in my mind was no, I'm not going to sign the letter because I, I do not make it my practice to get caught up in all the stuff go, that goes on on social media. Uh, that's just not my, my, my drive is, my passion is the word and teaching the word and studying the word and discipling women. But anyway, I was, I don't know, I just had a caution about maybe I shouldn't make such a rash decision. So I prayed about it for a few days and then I talked to my husband and I read him the letter most of the letter, and um, I said, what do you think? Do you think I should sign this or not? And uh, he said, I don't see any harm in you signing it. He said, I don't think it'll do any good, but I don't see any harm in you signing it. So I told the person I would, 
And, uh, but I do not make it my practice to do that. I don't get involved in all that stuff. Um, I don't feel that that's the main ministry God's called me to. But has she responded? Uh, yes, yeah, she has responded some on her Twitter account. I think we've, thus ladies have been called heretics, witch hunters, fault, you know, all kinds of things. But I have noticed since July 5th, uh, she's taken a break from her Twitter account. She's not writing anything. She's been very quiet. Uh, the LGBT community is coming behind her and, and supporting her and heralding her. Uh, she has taken out a section out of her book that she wrote in 2009 where she wrote a section on uh, her views on homosexuality. She was very strong against it, but since then she's taken it out. And she has an explanation on her Twitter account, and her explanation why she took that section out is because she felt her words exceeded God's words. So that's very dangerous, very telling to me. Um, I did email Justin Peters this morning and ask him if he's heard anything, because I, I don't know. It was very hotbed for a while, but since July 5th, she's been silent, and I don't know why. I hope, they're, I hope she's repenting. I've been praying. I've been fasting that Beth Moore would repent. Um, I don't know if she will. The next step, I don't know. Um, I'm going to talk to Justin. What's the next step? Have you been contacted by those, by any women whose eyes have been open? I've gotten some women that have emailed me thanking me for signing the letter. Um, I have had, I think, at least two women, and because I don't have Facebook or Twitter, I think it's hard to find me unless you get on my website and get my email address. But, um, and I don't answer my phone unless I know who's calling me, so... <laughs> I will call you back if you leave a message, but so many robocalls. Um, but two women have contacted me that I'm sure are her followers, and they were not kind, but I was very gracious and kind back, and I documented um, what I said and told them my concerns with her were far more reaching than her views on the LGBT community that I've had concerns for many years, and I documented why. And so, and then one of them actually responded back and said, thank you, I don't agree with you, but thank you for your graciousness or whatever. So I've tried to be gracious, um, but I'm not going to back down on what is true according to God's word. It's very clear, and that's what I told them. She needs to be definitive about what she believes about homosexuality, and she's not being, so that's very concerning. That was the end of Rachel Held and uh, Jen Hatmaker and some of those others. That was the downward spiral for them. So I don't know what's going to happen. T stay tuned. Uh, what are your opinions on the Nashville and Dallas statements? Do you think they're helpful? Again, I don't really, I mean, I know what you know, the gender thing and the social justice issues. I keep abreast of those things, especially my son and my son-in-law. You know, they get all into all that. And my husband and I know a little bit about it. And I don't know that they're helpful. This is, this is my opinion. This is not thus says the Lord. Uh, I really think that those things can be very distracting in the church. And what I've been concerned about is I've watched things like this which is my, what was my hesitation about signing that letter to Beth Moore, is that they pull us away from what we've just been talking about all weekend. It's Satan's tool to distract us from the one thing that's needful. And then the other thing I've seen is this hatred among Christian brothers and sisters on Twitter and Facebook. It's horrible. The the dividing that is going on. And uh, so that is very concerning. And that's why I normally don't get caught up in those type of things. So do I think they're helpful? I say probably in the long run, not so much. I think faithful men expositing the word in their churches is the best means for uh, your life and for spiritual growth. So um, that's my two cents and that's all it's worth. Might, might only be worth half a cent, but... How can I get my husband to have a desire for the word with me? Um, I think the best thing you can do is pray. And I would encourage you to fast and pray. Um, you have to remember that when you stand before the Lord, you're not going to be holding your husband's hand. You are going to be standing before him by yourself. So you need to run your race. You need to run it. According to the rules that God has set before you, you compete as an athlete who is submissive to the rules, and you can pray for your husband, lovingly encourage him. I know when my husband and I got married, we tried that. Um, 
we tried to have like devotions together. And so at night we'd get into bed and he'd say, I'm, uh, I'm going to pray first and then you pray. So he'd pray and then he, he'd say, Susan, it's your turn. I'd be, you know, I'd be, honey, it's your turn, you know. And uh, that never worked. We never tried studying the Bible together, but we did when our kids were growing up try to do that. And we found that the best model for us, this is the way we parented, was the Deuteronomy 6 principle. We just talked about things. We were sit down, lie down, rise up. We used the teachable moments. We found with our kids and with us a formal sitting down uh, actually just provoke, was more provoking than just going through life and teaching them the principles of Christ and his word. And so, um, but I have to think you have to work whatever works in your marriage. I know families, godly families that have family devotions, have family worship, uh, I think it's great if that's what works in your family. But uh, Lynn, again, you have to ha let your husband leave. But I pray for your husband and, uh, and don't nag him. Don't be his Holy Spirit. Don't be his mother. But you walk the walk regardless of what he does, okay? And, and uh, don't be the type of wife whose husband wants to dwell in the corner of the house because you won't stop being a dripping faucet. <laughs> But just pray, be content with where God has you, and um, that's my two cents again. Besides a spirit-filled marriage and the excellent life by Martha Peace, what are some other helpful resources on biblical marriage? Uh, the only one I know, I was asking Debbie about this too, I have read a lot of books on marriage, and I really don't find very many that are biblical. And I think a lot of the marriages, I, uh, a lot of the books today I see on marriage for Christians are trying to put the 21st century America in there. And they're not biblical. So John MacArthur has a good one on the family where he deals with husband-wife relationship and parenting. But honestly, uh, I mean, again, Karen may be able to belt one out, but I have not found very many that are very biblical. There's some, there were some good ideas, but some are really cheesy and some are just downright I mean, I feel like I'm reading a romance novel and not, you know, not something to guide me into truth. So, again, Karen, you got anything? Can they? Okay. There you go. I would say ask your pastor, too. But uh, my husband and I have used, uh, uh, in premarital counseling, we've used Wayne Max material, R.C. Sproul's material, uh, John MacArthur's material, and I think that's about... A dead guy? That was the, those are the best ones. The dead ones are the best ones. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay, Susan, what advice would you give to young women who are in courtship? In addition to studying, memorizing, applying the word, as well as time and prayer, what are ways you would suggest making use of my time as a young woman with which courtship is going well. There's a second question by a different person. What are some book studies you would suggest for young women in courtship? Well, as it would so be, I just read a book that I endorsed called um, Already Beloved, uh, Love Relationship and Finding Fulfillment in Christ. And it's the, a companion to a book called Being Mr. Right. That's for the male and for the female is Already Beloved. And it's uh, the male version is out. The female version is coming out because uh, I just endorsed it. But those are very good on how to prepare yourself to be the right person and cultivating your relationship with Christ. Uh, and it, it is really good. I haven't read the Mr. Right, but I read his wife's companion book. It's called Already Beloved. Um, and I would say that's that's what I would do. I would encourage you to uh, not so much be looking for Mr. Right, but make that's what you want to do. Be a woman of the word and a godly man will be attracted to that, right? So, okay, I don't think I'll ever be married. Is it okay to pray for the gift of singleness and mainly that any sexual desire will be removed? Um, you may have the gift of celibacy. I don't know. Uh, I know women that do have the gift of celibacy, which is the gift of singleness. Um, if you... If you don't feel you have the gift of singleness, um, I don't know that you should be praying for it, but if you're not going to get married, it would be good wise to pray that the uh, Lord, Lord will give you uh, self-control in the area of uh, sexual lust or anything like that. Definitely would encourage you to guard your, 
your heart, your mind. I wouldn't be watching things that would be um, provocative in any way or stimulating in any way. I wouldn't be reading things you shouldn't read, um, anything like that. But if God has called you to singleness, I think he would make that very clear to you. And if you have a desire to get married, then he probably hasn't called you to be single. So uh, just start praying. Read that book. Be loved on how to be the Mrs. Right or something. But And pray. If you want to get married, pray. Ask God to provide a spouse for you. Okay, what are some practical ways we can turn our hearts to desire less things of the world and desire more things of the Lord? <clears throat> I think as we talked about last night, taste and see that the Lord is good. The more you taste Him the more you want that and you don't want less, you want less of the other. Uh, we were talking to a gal, Debbie and I, uh, Thursday when we, we came in, some ladies picked us up and we went out to eat. And uh, one of the gals said that <clears throat> she was on some diet. Everybody's always on a diet. But um, except me, I'm not ever. But anyway, she said that uh, we had dessert and she said, well, she said, I'm on this diet and I don't eat sugar anymore. And, and she said, so the more I uh, eat, you know, like I'm eating, she said, just a piece of fruit is satisfying. I don't need sugar anymore. And I thought that was a good analogy because the more we eat of the right thing, of the Word of God, the other stuff, in fact, things that I used to be okay with a year or two ago, I'm not anymore. It like, seems like the more I grow in my relationship with the Lord, and I'm not saying that arrogantly, I just, I just don't want that other stuff anymore. And it wasn't sinful things. It's just like it's, it's losing its appeal. It has no luster anymore. So uh, I definitely would just taste and see the Lord is good. And then the second part of this question, are there any materials you would recommend, books, sermons, series? Outside of the Bible, um, I would say one book that really impacted me was uh, J.C. Ryle's Holiness. Uh, it was excellent. It's, it's a good read. Um, I think Debbie's reading it right now or listening to it on audio, aren't you? And um, it was very good. It really, it really um, provoked me in a good way. J.C. Ryle, Holiness. Again, he's dead. So I always, <laughs> dead people are the best ones to quote. In fact, I have some people that have endorsed my books that I would like to take their endorsement off because they're no longer doing the right thing. But I don't know what you do when you get those names on there, how you get their endorsements off your books. Um, if these teachings are causing us to think that we may not be saved, what can we do to call out to God to truly become His? That's a very good question. I actually was just speaking in another city, and a lady came up to me, and she said, I used to go to Cornerstone Church, this church. Every time you came to speak, I went home and told my husband, I don't think I'm saved. And she said, but I want you to know I got saved. And she said, my life has really changed. And she said, I'm in a good church here. She's in a new, she doesn't go here anymore. She's living in another state. So if these teachings are causing you to think you might not be saved, what I would do, I would thoroughly examine myself in light of uh, 1 John and James. I would ask, uh, in fact, I have a, the book back there, Life Dominating Sins, in the back, I have all the tests, the spiritual tests. You know, Paul says, examine yourself, see if you're in the faith. And so I go through all those in James, all those in 1 John. I would really sit down with the Lord. Ask yourself honestly, do I love the brethren? Do, you know, all those things that are markers of true Christians. Don't play spiritual gymnastics with yourself. This is like, you're talking about your soul, right? So make, be honest with yourself, be honest with God. And uh, after that, I would, if you are not convinced that you truly have a living relationship with the living God, that you have not repented of your sins. And, you know, when I got saved, I, I first time in my life, I saw myself as a sinner. I'd never seen myself as a sinner. I'd gotten saved and baptized three times. I never, never saw myself as a sinner. And I never wept over my sin, never was sorry for it in any way. So I repented and I, I gave my life to the Lordship of Christ. And uh, that was a, a huge change for me. So I would call on the name of the Lord and, and call out for his mercy to save you and give you a new heart. Um, if you could go back in time before your children were grown, what do you wish you had done differently as a mother? Well, I wasn't a believer in those first 10 years of marriage. And I had a child, uh, I got married and got pregnant six months into our marriage. So um, when the children were young, I was not a believer. 
And I'm so thankful. They don't remember any of that. But, uh, you know, that portion that says that the, what the locust has eaten, God's able to restore. Um, they only remember good things about me. That's really good. So, um, so obviously I wished I'd been redeemed, but God is sovereign in the day of our salvation. So um, I also wish that I had been more, uh, again, this goes back to not being saved, more submissive to their father, uh, more respectful, uh, things like that. I remember after the Lord saved me, one of the ladies that disciples me said, Susan, don't ever dishonor your husband in front of your children. And I really tried to do that. So if I ever had a, <clears throat> a disagreement with Doug or something I wanted to talk to him about when the kids were growing up, I'd wait till evening or till we could be alone to talk about it. So I wish I had done that a little bit differently. Um, sometimes I wish I hadn't been so meticulous about uh, you know, my husband laughs. He says, you run this home like a military, you know, and every Lincoln log has to be counted before they go to bed, every tinker toy. And so if there's a hundred in the box and they only picked up 99, where's that one, you know? So there's times I thought, man, I wish I hadn't done that, you know, enjoy. But I, I really did enjoy my children. I still enjoy my children, uh, even though they're 42 and 39. And I enjoy my grandkids and try to spend as much time as I can with them. But um, but I can say that my husband was a was and is an excellent father, and uh, he taught the children well, uh, Deuteronomy six six, and still does. And they have wonderful, wonderful memories of uh, him. And uh, yeah, when he had his stroke, that kind of got to both of them. And I've noticed they've come to visit more often because I think <laughs> they think they don't know how much more time that he has. So. Anyway, but, and he's a great grandpa too. <clears throat> so, okay. What does meditating on the word look like? Um, meditating, as we talked about, is murmuring in a low tone of voice until it becomes implanted on your mind. So the best way to meditate is to memorize. Um, for example, just recently, I'm, I'm memorizing Luke 9, and the parable of the sowers in Luke 9 is different than Matthew and Mark. And so I came across a verse that says, and those who have a good and honest heart bring forth fruit with patience. And I was like, who has a good and honest heart? I, I really puzzled me. So I pondered that. That made me think, well, Matthew and Mark don't talk about anybody that has a good and honest heart in the parable of the soils. Why is Luke saying that? And so that is meditation. And I pondered it for a long time. And then I asked my husband, I said, why, why does Luke say that? Nobody has a good and honest heart. So he gave me his two cents on that. But that's meditation where you're forced to just like, you're going over and over something in your mind, a, a passage or scripture, and it makes you think about it. And so uh, and a lot of times you meditate to the point that you realize you've got to make some changes in your life. You realize that you're not measuring up to what God says. So that is biblical meditation. It's not sitting around and humming, mm, you know, or doing anything like that. It's not meditation. But you know what? We don't, I was noticing even last night when the hotel was playing music outside the door, the lobby area, and it was in the parking lot too. We can't stand to be quiet anymore. Have you noticed that? You go out to eat and there's loud music. You go, you know, everywhere there's noise and music. And uh, we don't even sit long enough in a, in a quiet area to be able to think. I don't know how people do it. Um, I, I have to have almost complete silence when I study. And so I've learned to uh, put headphones in when I'm trying to work just because I don't like the distractions. But so me meditation is hard if you're not in a quiet place to think. So uh, I would try to remove as much noise as you can from your life. The world's noisy enough, isn't it? Okay, how important is physical attraction when seeking a spouse? Should a lack of physical attraction prevent me from getting to know someone? Uh, someone, I don't know what the word is, <clears throat> or courting them. Um, you know, physical attraction is bogus. I mean, it's, I mean, who's, you know, we're all kind of weird looking, aren't we? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think we need to remember the body is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. So I'm not saying, you know, don't look for a nice looking, you know, guy or anything like that. But just remember, looks are deceiving, and um, I think of all the good-looking men in Scripture, uh, they had some problems, right? <laughs> uh, David was handsome. Look what happened to him. I mean, you know, beautiful women. He saw a beautiful woman. He took her. Uh, so beauty can be, charm is deceptive, beauty is vain. A woman who fears the Lord, she will be praised, Proverbs 31. So uh, I'm not saying 
you know, I'm not undermining a nice looking man or anything like that, but don't pick a spouse based on outward looks. Um, you want to go for the heart. Do they love the Lord? Uh, do they want to serve the Lord? Do, are they sold out to the Lord? Is their passion the Lord, uh, the glory of God? That, you know, that'll supersede any outward, and then he will become beautiful to you. You're right? So that's what I would say. <clears throat> okay. How do I put evil suspicion to death? Um, what I would do to put evil suspicion to death is Philippians 4, 8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, no, that whole list. Uh, and I would say, is this true? Is this lovely? Is this a true thought? Is this a lovely thought? Is this a virtuous thought? Is this a thought of good report? And I would memorize Philippians 4, 8. And then every time you have a thought that comes to your mind that is evil suspicion, I would Philippians 4, 8 it, and I would put it to death. I would smash it. We are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so, in fact, the other day, I was going through systematic theology with a gal I'm discipling, and we were talking about sin and when does sin start. So I was coming home and was talking to my husband. And I said, so when do you think sin begins? Like, if you get angry, when does it, when does it start? He said, the first time it comes in your mind, that's a sin. And uh, so we started talking about it a little bit. And so, you know, you want to, as soon as you get those thoughts in your mind that you know are not right, this is, this is an opposition to God, you want to put it to death, smash it, demolish it. Uh, that's why you should be memorizing the word of God. The godly man meditates day and night, right? That's what they're putting in their mind. So um, I would... Philippians 4, 8 it. And also maybe be more, learn to be more thankful. Instead of being always suspicious about other people or things, be more thankful. Try to find the good in others and not the evil in other people. Okay. Um, as a young Christian lady on a large university campus, how can you encourage me with regards to friendships and getting involved in campus life? It's so ungodly, and the worldly influences are shocking and relentless. I want to honor the Lord and grow in Him. It's difficult to find like-minded young women. Well, girl, I'm 63, and it's difficult to find. <laughs> I'm serious. It really is. I, it's very hard to find women my age that are like-minded. Most of my friends are from family and church family, and they are all older than me. Sometimes I feel alone. I know I'm not. You know, this is a very good question, and, um, you know, the Bible says bad company corrupts good morals, and yet the Bible says Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So how you reconcile that, you know? Uh, that's, those are seems like, oh, the Bible's contradictory. No, it's not. <clears throat> the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Bad company does corrupt good morals, and Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But when Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, what was his purpose? I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinners, right? So his purpose was to evangelize them. And so what I would do is I would spend time with these ladies on campus, but I would be cautious about where you go, what you do with them. But I would also be bold. I would share the gospel with them. Uh, I would show them Christ by the way you live your life. I wouldn't participate in their uh, ungodly activities, uh, their, their off-color jokes, uh, anything like that. And if you find that they are having greater influence on you than you are on them, then I would probably pull away because uh, you don't want to be deceived. In fact, Paul says, don't be deceived about this. Bad company corrupts good morals. I've seen women who have gone down the tube spiritually because of the, the girlfriends they hang out with. So we want to be very careful. And that is a very good question. And pray. Pray for God to protect you. Um, that, is, that is so hard. But you know, it's not just universities anymore. It's everywhere. It's even in the church, ladies. Um, that it's really hard to... Because the church has become like the world in many ways. Um, so just guard yourself, protect yourself. Find someone to hold you accountable. I don't know how old you are. Uh, I would find someone like-minded to hold you accountable, someone to mentor you, pray for you, ask you the hard questions, and be willing to get into your life. Uh, can the pastor's wife be called a pastor as well? <clears throat> 
oh, I, that's happened to me. They go, oh, so you, you and your husband are pastors. And I go, no, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> because a pastor is a shepherd. He's an overseer. He's an elder. Those, all those words are interchangeable. And the Bible says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. It's a man, not a woman. So usually what I say when someone says, oh, you're a pastor with your husband. I say, no, but I do help my husband shepherd his flock. I try to shepherd the women and help him in that process, but I am not a pastor. So I would be very careful about calling your pastor's wife a pastor, but uh, just because of the uh, the Greek word that it is an overseer, a bishop, an elder. Um, what are some key scriptures? This is the last question. Uh, what, are, what are some, and I think she did say, I don't know if you, uh, some of you came in late. I think some of you still had questions and I will be at the book table when I get done with this last session and uh, while Debbie's packing up books, if you need to ask me anything, uh, our flight doesn't leave till 7.30 tonight, so um, I can ask, answer your questions out there, Lord willing, if I know the answers. If I don't, well, that's just, that's the way it is. Call Karen. <laughs> um, what are some key scriptures that will help me to better evangelize? Well, the first one I th thought it was the Great Commission. It's a command, go into all. And I wasn't sure on this question. I didn't know if you were asking me, like you want to know the gospel better to evangelize, or if you were asking um, verses on how to motivate you to share the gospel. So let me answer that first. Matthew 28 is a command. You're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is a command by God. Acts 26, 18 is great. Pray that God will, uh, as he did with Paul, uh, that you can go and open their eyes, be a part of opening their eyes from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among the saints. So that would be one that would be motivating. Uh, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And so uh, read about hell. Look at all the passages about hell. That'll motivate you a little bit. Um, it should motivate us. Now, so that would be some key passage. Now, if you're wanting to know, like, how, how to share the gospel, um, I have that little booklet out there. And then also, um, Will Metzger, To Tell the Truth, is a great book on evangelizing. Um, he talks about, oh, that's my phone. Would you mind turning that off? I'm sorry. If my husband was here, I'd be in trouble. Um, <laughs> I, was te I was texting uh, my, our associate pastor's wife, which is why my phone's on, because I loaned her that book, that companion book, Mr. Wright, and the female version, because she has kids, she has daughters that are becoming the age of that, of dating or courtship or whatever. So she had sent me one back. And by the way, while she did, she said, caution the women about Josh Harris, I kiss dating goodbye, because she said he's getting a divorce. And so, there you go. So what did I tell you? Like, every day, there's somebody new that's, you know. So, uh, she sent me the text that he, uh, his Twitter account where he's getting a divorce, he and his wife. So, he kissed dating goodbye, and he's kissing marriage goodbye. So, it's, an, it's just, it's heartbreaking, ladies. It's really heartbreaking. So, did you turn that off? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, well. I'm not responsible. <laughs> um, anyway, I, you know, I hate to even recommend books anymore, but Mark, uh, not Mark, I am reading Mark Dever's book on uh, evangelism, and it's pretty good. It just doesn't give, uh, to me, enough help, but it's pretty good. But uh, Will Mesker, to tell the truth, tells uh, how, how to turn everyday conversations into spiritual conversations and uh, how to give the whole gospel to the whole person. So I wasn't sure what you meant exactly on this, but if you want to come to the book table afterwards, I'll be glad to help. You want to bring me that? So I, just, I just don't want it to go off. Or My husband likes to call. I mean, it's like right the moment I get done to see how things go, and I would hate for him to, to call as I'm winding out this conference. So... Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, this is good. I'll hand it back to you. I, I, I don't need it right now, so... Thank, unless you want to see pictures of my grandkids. But. Did I do it? Did I do it? Yeah, thank you so much. Anyway, that was heartbreaking when um, this, the, our, our new associate pastor's wife just sent me that text. I was like, goodness, another one.